who do you believe about climate change? You know, this has been going on for, oh, in real intense manners, about uh, 15 years. Uh, the climate change program started with the original Bush administration back in 1991. And that's when actually I came in, uh, fresh out of graduate school from the University of New Hampshire. And uh, the idea was we didn't know enough about climate change, so we better do some research on it. And uh, that was the impetus for it. But in that time, you know, you hear everything from the big climate change fraud, what global warming, no scientific proof on one side, the flip side, be worried, be very worried, it's global warming, stupid, and probably my favorite, we're screwed, right? So you got everything from one end to the other, and, and if you listen to the public, you know, the debate's just about equal on both sides. And like every story, you know, there's some truth on, on both. And so what I'm going to do is just take a few minutes up here to give you uh, my perspective, having studied this for about 25 years, on, on how I interpret this and, and what we can, uh, what we should be expecting now in the future. So with all this, you know, it's really hard to tell what's going on. I mean, these things are, here's an example. You've got this, this picture of these circles that aren't moving, but they seem to be moving, you know, which, what's, what's the reality here? But in truth, climate change isn't really anything new. It goes way back. It goes back to the uh, early 19th century. Uh, a fellow by the name of Joseph Fourier back in 1824 originally uh, discovered the greenhouse gas effect, what we call these, these gases that help to keep the planet uh, from looking more like the moon. And you've all seen these, uh, these kinds of graphs where we have carbon emissions going back a thousand years and nothing's going on until people come along and, and we do a little bit of clearing of of uh, forests and that has a little bit of an impact, but you hit that button, your screen goes away, you're going to hit it again, it comes back. I guess I should have figured this out while I'm sitting up here, but that's the here. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have no, uh, no CO2 emission for, until you get to about the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, in which case it starts to go up with the burning of fossil fuels. And of course, when you burn CO2, you're going to have it accumulate in the atmosphere, so Atmospheric CO2 concentrations begin to rise uh, as they are currently. And they talk about the greenhouse gas effect, but I like to think of it more about like the pickup truck effect because in the hubs that I direct, uh, most of my clients are farmers and foresters. And you know, they don't look at the world from like, spacesuits up in up in the top of the stratosphere. They look at the world through pickup trucks. And everyone knows if you pick, set your pickup truck in the uh, <coughs> South Carolina or Georgia sun and middle of July, get the windows rolled down, it's going to get hot in there. But the more you start rolling up those windows, the hotter and hotter it will get. If you roll them all the way up, you won't be able to sit in that pickup. And that's basically all, all it is with climate change and these greenhouse gases. It's like we're rolling up the, the windows on our pickup truck uh, of the earth and we're accumulating more and more of that heat with increasing CO2. So they go through you know, the, all these different reasons that, that climate change is increasing or decreasing, and uh, they come up with this what they call this net forcing due to human activity. So this is how much we're supposed to be warming. Uh, some things cool it, like volcanoes and sulfate aerosols, like uh, sulfur and other types of things, carbon dioxide, methane warm it. They get this budget balance thing, and they come up with we should be warming. And if you read the scientific literature, the scientific literature will say that. 97, 97.5, 98.5% of scientists say that anthropogenic climate change is real. The truth of the matter is it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all what the cause of climate change is. Because number one, you know, we don't really impact climate change that much ourselves, but we're the recipient of climate change and climate variability. If you're a farmer, he can't always he can't control where the, the sun's out or whether it's raining, but he or she has to deal with that. And that's the same with forestry and forest products. And the second reason it really doesn't matter is because this long-term change is not going to have as much impact as the short-term variability. So if you're planting trees, you need to know what the weather's going to be like this spring uh, for, for planting conditions or for controlled burns or for you know, a hot, dry summer. Uh, you need to increase your number of firefighters you're going to be managing for. That makes a whole lot more impact on what you do as a forester than something <laughs> in the year 2100. Whatever is going on in 2100. And whoever caused what's going on in 2100. The short term is what really matters. You know, there's a lot of good examples of this. These are just some maps 
from year to year that are the drought maps for the U.S. And you can see that the more red that you have, the more dry the conditions are. So you'll have these areas like in August of 2010, kind of a little bit of sporadic drought everywhere. <coughs> By 2011, August, we had the big Texas drought and Oklahoma drought, also drought in, in uh, Georgia. Jump ahead another year and that droughts moved up into the central plains of the United States. It's pretty widespread everywhere else. Uh, by 2013, the droughts kind of moved out of the central plain and it moved west a little bit more. By 2014, the big Florida or the California drought that we all know about has really set in. Texas and Oklahoma are developing another drought, and there's some scattered drought in the rest of the southeast. This is not looking out 50 years or 75 years. This is year to year, month to month variation. This is the kind of variation that impacts what you do in forest management, when you can get out there, when you can harvest, when you can um, do different types of treatments. <coughs> now it is true that there has been steady increases in the temperature globally over the last, uh, really last 40 some odd years. In truth, we have not had an average global monthly temperature since the Carter administration. So in other words, if you look at global temperatures, every month since the time Jimmy Carter was in office has been above average. Some months more than a little, some months a lot. And this last particular uh, six months with the El Nino that we just come off of have been way above average. So there is increased temperature globally. Uh, this is a, I pulled this off the web, so this is not an endorsement of anyone. I just couldn't get rid of it without getting rid of the title, so uh, there's no relative relationship there. But this talks about the uh, Americas without a winter. This is this last winter we've just gone through, and it's been the warmest we've ever recorded. So in the history of record keeping going back to the 1800s, we've never seen a warmer winter across the U.S. And also that means that uh, 20, 2015 was the warmest we've ever seen in the planet. You know, the thing is, though, we don't live in the whole planet. We live in the southeastern United States. And so while the planet has been warming, generally, not all of it's been warming equally, including where we live. Where we live, if you look at the long-term temperature record going back uh, to the 1800s, from 1900 to present, we've actually cooled. Now, I can give you a whole lecture on why we've cooled, but the, but the point of the matter is we've cooled, and that's the world we live in. So we have this southeastern area where if you're in Alabama, and parts of Mississippi, it's gotten cooler. Other parts have warmed a little bit, like North Carolina and you know, Florida, but generally we haven't seen the warming that a lot of other places have. So if you talk to foresters, if you are out there and say, I haven't seen this warming, I live in... Alabama, I, I don't, it's no warmer now than it was when I was a child. They're right. There it hasn't warmed. So what's next? What's this mean? Well, the first thing it means is that these are not new issues. These aren't new problems. This is a picture of my uh, uh, great uncle, Bill Edenthal. He was a forest supervisor, U.S. forest supervisor of the Colville National Forest uh, back in the early 1960s. And they had the same issues then that we have now. I see heads now. That's good then. You know, here his talk was on conservation for a better tomorrow. 1963. 1963. Not 2003, 1963. These are issues that we were addressing then and we're addressing now. So we're not talking about when you're, when you're talking with your... Uh, Landowners or land managers or consulting foresters, these aren't new issues. These are the same issues. Maybe they're a little more, maybe they're a little less, depending on where you are, but they're the same basic issues. Now, there are some things we've learned in all these years about how the weather is going to change and how climate variability is going to change. And one of the interesting things that you can know without finding out too much information is if we're going to have an El Nino year, like we just had, a La Nina year, which is the opposite of what we just had. That's when that Pacific water off South America cools. That's La Nina in, the, in December. El Nino is what we just had where it warms up. If we have a La Nina year, when the water cools, 
then you can expect to see a lot of these um, <coughs> blue dot, these blue squares. So you can kind of see them along the bottom here. And so this is a temperature line going from uh, 1965 to present, and the temperature has been going up. That's true. But what we also know is within that general increase in temperature, if it's a La Nina year, it's going to be cooler than normal. It's going to be cooler than what you've been experiencing uh, recently. If it's an El Nino year, like we've just had, that's the red dots. It's going to be warmer. So if you hear a lot of talk in the news about an El Nino year, expect it to be wet and expect it to be warm. If it's an El Nino, La Nina, excuse me, expect to be cool and wet in the winters. That's what that means. So for planning purposes, for, for management purposes, you can already predict that. You don't need anybody else to tell you anything else. That's a really strong relationship. If it's a neutral year, if you're not hearing any of this stuff, anything about El Nino, La Nina in the news, it's going to be a neutral year. It's going to be about what you would expect from previous years. And the only uh, uh, change from that is if there's going to be a volcano. If you're going to talk about some big volcano going off, it's going to be cool. Because volcanoes act kind of like umbrellas. They put a lot of soot in the atmosphere. They put the soot, it blocks the sunlight. And when they block that sunlight, it keeps the planet from getting real warm back right here. Uh, some, some years, like Krakatoa, they, the volcano activity was so great that they actually had frosts in the middle of summer in New England. So volcanoes can have an impact. Moving forward. Okay, this is the uh, temperature uh, predictions moving forward. Well, you know, they talk about um, uh, ranges of temperature. These temperatures have to do with how fast we put CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That's the majority of what this variation is. There's some variation in how the models predict the atmosphere will react to that, but most of that variation has to do with how much CO2 we put in. The only thing that they all have in common is they all predict it's going to get warmer. There are no models that predict it's going to get cooler anytime soon. CO2 has a lifespan of about 100 years. So when you breathe it out, like we're doing right now, it varies, but it generally takes about 100 years for that CO2 to get back into the bottom of the ocean or back into the soil or tie up in a tree, something like that. It just depends. Now, specifically, in the southeast, if you remember, we had warmth. We're starting to warm now. So that graph that went from 1900 to 2000 didn't show a lot of warming. But with the Clean Air Acts of the 1970s and 1990s, those sulfate aerosols, those same kinds of uh, aerosols that come from volcanoes that were keeping us from warming up in the southeast have been cleaned up. You, know, you talk to farmers, they'll tell you now we need to start putting sulfur on our fields again. We don't have enough sulfur. That, that damn Clean Air Amendment took away our sulfur, now we got to add it in. Well, that sulfur also kept it a little bit cool down here. It's gone. So now we have to add the sulfur. Now it's going to start to warm up a little bit more. So this, this is a graph, an uh, average graph that shows historically how many 90 degree days there are across the southeast, sort of 71 to 2000, and how that might change 30 years from now, 20 years from now, on the bottom. And so this difference is, is this graph here. It depends on where you are. You may expect to see two weeks or maybe a month or more of these 95 degree days, more than we have now. That's a big change. That's going to have some impacts. All right, there's some good news. There's some good news with, with climate change. You may not, they may, we don't talk about it as much with, as a scientist or scientific community, because in the short term, at least, there's some good things going on with climate change. This is a really interesting study. Have you ever heard of this Biosphere 2 mm -hmm. project? It's big, like 20 years ago. It was in Arizona, and uh, they, they took this and uh, built this huge complex. I think it was supposed to be something they were going to use for building space stations on Mars or something. And they wanted to see if people could actually live in these things. So they took this area out in the middle of Arizona, and they brought in a bunch of cement and built this thing up and put glass on top of it. Then they brought in a bunch of soil, which was basically feedlot soil, which was full of manure, really rich CO2. And they dumped it in there and they put plants, they made ocean, little mini oceans and forests and all this stuff in there, put people in there and, and saw what would happen. Well, they didn't expect how much CO2 would come out of the decomposition of all that cow manure. And 
uh, effervescing from the uh, concrete they put in. So they had concentrations of CO2 going up from about 350 parts per million, which is kind of where we were at the time, to about 10,000 over time. So these things got so much CO2 in them that people were starting to have a hard time breathing, right? We're never going to see 10,000 CO2, no matter what we do in the world. But it was a really interesting experiment to say, what happens if you add CO2 uh, to the atmosphere? Uh, how does that affect plant growth? Well, what they saw was that the plants grew so fast, the trees would grow like 30, 40 feet in six months. I mean, they had these, these poplars. They would grow so fast that they had to use poles to keep them up. Because from a wood products industry, one of the things that we know, faster you grow, the less lignin you have in your cell structure. So if you want a really hard, you guys know this more than I do, if you want a really hard piece of lumber, you get old growth, right? Old growth, slow growth, dense wood, full of lignin, that's your hardest lumber, right? Old, you know, southern pine, that's kind of stuff, good stuff. Oh, whatever it is, same thing. Well, these things are growing so fast, they didn't have enough lignin in their material to even support their own weight. So these things, these had trees that were just falling all over the place. It was, it was a colossal disaster, but it does show what happens when you have that much CO2. Now, we're not going to get anywhere near that level of CO2, but as CO2 increases in the atmosphere, we will get a certain amount of CO2 greening effect. So this is the amount of as CO2 increases. It's easier for the plants to take that CO2 up, and they use less water vapor. So their, what they call water use efficiency, increases. So if you have enough nutrients to support that growth, the increasing CO2 that we're putting in the atmosphere can help a little bit with plant growth. Now it'll make the wood a little less lignin, and depending if you're making bulk or if you're using it for lumber, that might be a good or a bad thing. But it will slightly decrease that. So that's good. That's, a, that's positive. Here's just an example of what happens with different levels of CO2. So ambient levels, uh, 150, 300, which is uh, where they were probably when this picture was taken. We're at over 400 now. Um, and 450 was considered an ambient at, at that level. So, um, oh, this is plus. So this was, uh, ambient level was 375, plus 150, plus 300, plus 450. Basically, it increases growth. Now, this is just from the biosphere. I had problems keeping people alive when it got up that high, but that's not our concern in forestry. Okay, uh, the second thing is that increasing air temperatures in the short term will increase tree growth in many areas of southeastern United States. So Pine Map is a project that maybe, has anybody heard of Pine Map project down here? Okay. So it's a project that's a $20 million NIFA, USDA funded project, that's wrapping up now. It's going on for about five years. We've got a one-year extension. Uh, we're in that extension now. And what the idea was is to see how much we could try to increase southern U.S., southeastern U.S. high productivity. <coughs> and so we did a bunch of different field experiments and all kinds of things, including some modeling. And the model that I work with is a model called WASC. It's primarily a water model, but it also predicts uh, productivity. And so we've run it with uh, different general circulation models, different climate models, up to the year uh, by 2030. So short term, things that matter. Now what we found uh, when we run it with the low CO2 uh, increase conditions, that we get an increase of productivity anywhere from a negative 5%, or excuse me, negative 1% in Texas, uh, to about a 6% increase, 6.5% 6, 6 increase in the far northeast. And so what we're seeing is that these areas where it's getting warmer, productivity is going up. Because there's limits to the growing season. I don't know if you've seen the USDA uh, growth maps and, and uh, hardiness zones. But we've increased by about two weeks uh, over the last time they were updated in the 1950s. So the growing season is getting longer with the warming weather. And so that warming weather is allowing, in this case, Lavalli pine trees, Panis teeta, to grow longer. So it's increasing the productivity a little bit. If you use the uh, higher increase in, in uh, CO2, there's a little more warm. And so that increased productivity is a little more. It's still sort of that same range, but you get more of this bluish 4 to 6% increase. So in the short term, there's probably going to be a stimulus in productivity in the southeast 
associated with climate change. Now, as we go farther ahead and we end up having uh, more and more temperature uh, increases, we're probably going to see more of this creep where we have Texas, East Texas, those areas. It's going to, you know, right now it's on the margin. Can you go to Lava Valley and find it? If you've been out that way, you know that they get pretty far apart. They eventually, they just stop. Well, that is going to start moving farther eastward, as much with precipitation as temperature. And then in Florida, same sort of thing. It's going to march forward. These are areas that's going to be too warm for Lava Valley Pine. But on the flip side, we're going to start seeing it creep up into this area. So it's going to march northward. All right, there's some bad, too. Fair bias. All right, we talked about uh, the cooling that we've seen in the southeast, right? So that's the good news. The good news is that we haven't seen as much warming as, you know, like the northeast has seen a lot of warming. But despite the fact that we haven't seen the warming doesn't mean we've escaped from some of the problems. Because this is a, a <coughs> map that shows where we've had billion-dollar weather disasters from 1980 to 2012. Well, the darker the color, the more billion-dollar weather-related disasters we've seen. Not much of a relationship with warming, is there? Because all the big disasters have occurred right here. So they've had a lot of warming up in these areas, including Alaska. That's warm more than anything. That's up to 7 degrees on average every day. No major disasters. So we have these warming disasters, these weather disasters which are happening here. And what that tells us is it's not a function of warming. So there's a lot more that we need to be concerned about than just warming. It's not the warming that's a concern, it's other things. For example, with this increased growth that I just talked about from CO2 and, and the warming, we're going to have more biomass. So we're going to have a lot more forests that start to look like this. I don't know if you saw, maybe it was a couple of years ago, now maybe five, and it said that uh, CO2 is going to greatly increase <coughs> the amount of poison ivy growth relative to other species. So basically vines do really well under hotter conditions. And this is in poison ivy, this is other kinds of uh, cat briar and all kinds of stuff. But what it means is we're going to have a lot more of this biomass starting to accumulate. And so we need to be more aggressive in managing those biomass uh, and fuel loads because if not, this is a current example where we are. This is Georgia up here uh, coming down three notches in North Carolina. And this is the teragrams of carbon, the amount of biomass that we have in each of these states. So Georgia, North Carolina, Vermont, excuse me, Virginia, uh, Alabama are all in the top ten for biomass. So we have all this biomass sitting out there. So we're going to have more. Well, some genius scientist, this got into a, a science paper oh, about 15 years ago, wrote a paper that said that when it gets hot and it gets dry, you'd have more water. From a forest uh, subcultural standpoint, we may need to thin the trees out. Don't keep the stocking density so close. Move it apart a little bit so that you give these trees more water and more area to, uh, to draw from. Wood products. I'm going to close with just a couple of, couple of slides on this. Um, this is something we talked about wood products before. I, I did go to University of Wisconsin for my undergraduate, and I had a professor there by the name of Hans Kubler. And uh, some of you may know uh, Professor Kubler. He uh, famously said, he, he actually had the earliest class I ever had. It started at 7.05 in the morning. And uh, as an undergrad, you do not want to be in a class at 7.05. But he was this uh, classic German. You know, he was just tough as nails. And in his first day uh, in class, he said, you know, good afternoon, good morning, class. My name's uh, Professor Kugler. I'll be your teacher for uh, wood as a building material. This semester, he said, I will tell you this, that I, I did fight in World War II, but I will not tell you on which side. And uh, that pretty much set the tone for the whole class. He, uh, he, he, was, uh, he was a great teacher. But he instilled on us you know, the, the, the uh, benefits of wood. And uh, you know, in this new era of, of wood building, I think it's really changed a lot with the glues and the, and the types of uh, things that we can do. And there was a, a comment earlier about the steel versus wood. And one of my favorite uh, pictures from Professor Kubler's book was this. And this shows uh, wood beams supporting uh, twisted steel I-beams. So, you know, as these buildings would burn, uh, the beams would heat up to a point such that they literally melt. And the char from the wood beam would be sufficient enough that they could actually have the, the strength still to support these melted I-beams on top of them. 
You know, and this is from a building uh, 70 years ago or so. I think this actually may be from uh, World War II, one of the you know, uh, fire bombings they did and had this out of there. Uh, but with the, with the new types of glues and laminates they're doing, you know, I know, for example, in British Columbia, uh, they were approved an 18-story residential building for students at the university there. Uh, that was supposed to, as I understand, they approved in 2015. I think they're, they're building it now, but it'll be a 170 foot, 174 foot tall building, making the tallest wooden building in, in North America. So, you know, I think that the, that, along with the ability to uh, sequester some of this carbon in long term products, is, is one of the reasons that I think we're going to see a, a resurgence in wood building as a material. So, the take home points is climate is always has been and always will be variable and changing. Uh, increasing CO2 gas in the atmosphere are currently making climate more variable and changing than historically it has been. Uh, there are both positive and negative impacts of climate change variability and change, uh, climate variability and change on forest growth, with most of the benefits occurring now, and there'll be increasingly more negative benefits occur, or negative impacts occurring in the coming decades. Um, however, because of the increased variability, extreme negative impacts could occur at any time, but it's hard to predict exactly when or where. So anytime you get something that's a more unstable system, a more variable system, you can have some really extremes occurring. And that's the atmospheric conditions that we're now living in. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to happen, but the possibility is greater than it used to be. It may never happen. It may, it may happen um, 30 years from now. But we just can't always tell. So when you're managing these forests, you have to take that in mind. And there's a lot of practical applications you can do to reduce your risk, even if there's increased variability. All right, thank you.